up until this point in the course, we've largely been dealing with structures of compounds, uh, their physical properties. Uh, we looked at shapes of molecules, how we depict molecules, and that sort of thing. And we've only really just touched on reactions. The next few chapters, we're going to dive right into some of the most important reactions in organic chemistry. And in this chapter, we're going to look at substitution reactions specifically. So in the previous chapters, we touched on reaction mechanisms, but we really didn't go into a lot of detail. And we discussed some of the driving forces for reactions. In this chapter, we're going to deal with the most important substitution reactions in great detail. Um, the prediction of the major products of reactions is dependent on your understanding of the mechanism. So we're going to do a little brush up on the curved arrow formalism that we use for mechanisms. So as we go forward, there's some things you're going to want to pay attention to. Um, because we're going to deal very specifically with mechanisms, uh, we need to understand some important details. For instance, understanding the difference between what we call a unimolecular and a bimolecular process. These refer to the kinetic behavior of reactions. Um, as we look at substitution reactions, there are components of the substrate and the products that we need to look at closely. Um, there is a group called a leaving group. What are the, what's the nature of those? Uh, what do we mean when we're referring to the substrate? Uh, what do we uh, mean when we refer to nucleophiles and what is a nucleophile and what makes it nucleophilic? And how does solvent uh, come into play in these reactions? Um, and we're also going to deal with stereochemistry. So. Uh, when we look at these substitution reactions, once we have a mechanistic understanding of them, what's the outcome uh, of these reactions in a three-dimensional sense? Um, and then finally, how do we deduce and illustrate the movement of electrons uh, throughout the course of these reactions? In other words, how do we write the mechanisms? So a little review on curved arrow formalism. Uh, you remember that we use curved arrows to indicate the movement of electrons during the course of a chemical reaction. So you can see here uh, we have some really simple examples. Uh, to start with, we have um, the acid-base reaction of hydroxide reacting with hydrogen chloride. And you can see during the course of that reaction, there's some bond making and bond breaking that occur. Uh, we have two arrows that indicate mechanistically that this happens in one step. Uh, so if we follow along the flow of electron density, we can see a pair of electrons from hydroxide is going to form a bond to hydrogen. Uh, we can see that bond here in the product. And along with that, at the same time, the bond between hydrogen and chlorine breaks, and it breaks in such a way that those electrons that make up that bond end up on chlorine here as a non-bonded pair of electrons. The second example is also an acid-base reaction, and the only difference here uh, is a different base in the form of ammonia. But again, the same thing happens. Um, the ammonia acts as a, a Lewis base, an electron pair donor, it's using that pair of electrons to form a bond to hydrogen, so the curved arrow indicates that those electrons are going to be used to form that bond. Here is that bond. And at the same time, we have to break a bond to hydrogen, and those electrons are going to go with chlorine to form the chloride ion. Uh, so just to be clear about what's happening in these reactions, we use the curved arrows to indicate movement of electrons. And the most important thing is where is the tail and where is the head? And there are actually three possible scenarios for where the curved arrows can go in a mechanism. One is that it originates at a lone pair and it points to the atom to indicate the formation of a bond. The second is that the arrow can originate at a bond, and it can point to an atom to indicate the formation of a lone pair. And then finally, there is a scenario where the arrow begins at a bond and ends up with a new bond. So by way of an example, uh, let's revisit a mechanism that we already know. So the electrophilic addition of a hydrogen halide to an alkene. So I'm going to use my methyl cyclopentene here as an example. 
And we know this reaction, which we've learned previously, where an alkene can react with a hydrogen halide, and we get so-called Markovnikov addition, and so we would predict the product of this reaction accurately is this uh, methyl bromocyclopentane. So from a mechanistic point of view, the first thing that's going to happen is that the pair of electrons from the pi bond are going to move and form a bond to hydrogen, and we're going to break the hydrogen-bromine bond and move those electrons to the bromide. The products of that reaction are a carbocation and a bromide ion. So if you think about what happened in those two arrows and what those arrows are doing, in this case we have the arrow beginning at a bond and forming a bond. So we're taking the pi electrons and forming a sigma bond. In the second arrow, they're beginning at a bond, and they're forming a lone pair. In the second step of the mechanism, we get the formation of our product, and this happens simply by the formation of a bond between the bromine and the carbocation. If we think about what happens with that arrow, this arrow begins at a lone pair and forms a bond. So we see in that mechanism all three different scenarios uh, for uh, that mechanism. So one last thing to pay attention to is that electrons generally have a direction of flow, uh, meaning if you have multiple arrows in a single mechanistic step, then those multiple arrows will all go in one direction. They won't point toward each other or away from each other. So that example is, is seen really well in that first step of the mechanism. So you notice the electrons are going in this direction. And if you look at the products, that electron flow is reflected in the products. For instance, you'll notice that there is now a positive charge where the electrons came from, and there is a negative charge where the electrons ended up. So we took electrons away from the methyl cyclopentene, it's now positively charged. We move those electrons ultimately to bromine, it's now negatively charged. So keep track of your electron flow during the course of uh, each mechanistic step. Again, you can see that in the second example here, in the second step of the mechanism, you have a negative charge on bromine flowing toward the positive charge, and in the product, we no longer have those charges because we've essentially neutralized them by pushing the electrons back the other direction. So in our electrophilic addition reaction, we'd seen that pattern, so we can draw that mechanism pretty in a pretty straightforward manner. But how can you predict the direction of electron flow? And the answer is you can do that by identifying the Lewis acid and the Lewis base in the reaction. So the thing to remember is Lewis bases are electron player donors, so this is typically where electrons come from, and Lewis acids are electron pair acceptors. This is where the electrons go to. And if we look at the structures of these things, we should also be able to identify uh, the highest occupied molecular orbital from which the electrons come in the Lewis base and the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital in which the electrons go in the Lewis acid. So here's two really simple examples of that. We have the reaction of a fluoride ion uh, with uh, trifluoroborane. Uh, boron is an open shell compound, so in its neutral form there are only six pairs of electrons, the three bonds we see to, bromine, to the boron, and there's an empty p orbital, a 2p orbital. And Lewis bases, like fluoride ion, will react with that quite readily and form a bond and form the resulting ion, in this case the tetrafluoroborate ion, which is a rather stable ion. Uh, we see that same sort of pattern of reactivity when negatively charged species react with carbocations. So, for instance, a methyl carbocation would be trigonal planar, empty p orbital, 
uh, it re reacts quite readily with hydride ions to form neutral methane molecule. So Lewis base, electron pair donor, Lewis acid, Lewis base, electron pair donor, Lewis acid, electron pair acceptor. And so if we understand which is the Lewis acid and the Lewis base, we understand the flow of electron density from the base to the acid. So these reactions occur because there's a net stabilization uh, in the product. The product is more stable than the reactive species we start with. So we have, uh, in our Lewis base, a filled orbital with a pair of electrons. We have somewhere in our Lewis acid an empty orbital. These orbitals are of similar energies, typically, in order for reaction to occur. In this illustration, they're indicated at the same energy, but they just simply need to be close. But when the electron pair is donated into that empty orbital, we form a new pair of molecular orbitals. And if the reaction is favorable, that new bonding molecular orbital will be lower in energy than where we started with either of these species, and we get a net stabilization. That stabilization corresponds to what we typically think of as the delta H for a reaction, the enthalpy change. And so if, if we get a net stabilization, it's an exothermic reaction. So in this chapter, we're going to deal with substitution reactions, specifically what are known as nucleophilic substitution reactions, because they involve the reaction of some nucleophilic species uh, with a substrate of some sort. So in our example that we see here that gives us kind of a schematic diagram of these reactions, um, what we have here on the left, this species we would call the substrate. So it's the organic compound uh, that's undergoing the reaction, and then it's going to react with our nucleophile. And the thing to understand about nucleophiles is that's just another word for a Lewis base. It's an electron pair donor. The overall reaction results in the nucleophile replacing some group on the substrate, this group that ultimately is replaced is called the leaving group uh, in, the, in the molecule. And we're going to look at each of these, each component of these things in turn. So this is the leaving group in the reaction. So we're going to look at all of the different aspects of this. We're going to look at the nature of nucleophiles, what is it about the structure of substrates that affects these reactions, what's important for something to act as a leaving group. Now, just as a little preview, in the next chapter, we're going to see a similar pair of reactants. So if you look here, this is a type of reaction we're going to deal with in Chapter 8. We have a substrate, and these substrates will often be the same kinds of substrates we're going to look at in this chapter. It's going to react with a base, but in these reactions, the base is going to react more in a Bronsted sense. than it is in a Lewis sense, and it's going to deprotonate these substrates and give rise to an alkene product. So this can lead to a, sometimes a little bit of confusion because of the similarity between these species and the similarity between these species. Uh, at the same time, it also uh, is a reality that you can actually get both substitution and elimination reactions occurring under essentially the same reaction conditions. And so we're going to sort those things out uh, toward the end of Chapter 8. So here's some examples of some typical nucleophilic substitution reactions. Um, in each case here, you'll notice that we have, uh, if we start with the substrates, so the substrates are these organic compounds you see here uh, listed. And the thing that they all have in common is that they all bear um, some kind of leaving group. So for instance, this one has an iodide. Uh, this one has here a trimethylamine as a leaving group because it's an ammonium ion. Here we have a chloride ion. Uh, here we have an azide. Uh, 
uh, and we'll talk about those compounds in more detail later. And here we have an iodide. Um, and so those leaving groups you can all see reflected on the right-hand side of the equation. The other thing that they all have in common is um, in these reactions is that there is some nucleophilic species, typically an anion, but not always. Uh, so, for instance, hydroxide ion, uh, sulfide ion, cyanide ion, fluoride ion are all good nucleophiles, but um, there is no requirement that a nucleophile bear a negative charge. It can actually be a neutral species. Ammonia, for instance, is quite nucleophilic. It has a non-bonded pair of electrons, as do all of these species, and so they can act as electron pair donors. The other thing to note is that often the, spe the uh, reagents that we use are in the form of some sort of ionic salt. Um, so if you look at each of these nucleophiles, you can see the nucleophile is paired with a counter ion. Um, so in this case, the hydroxide comes in the form of potassium hydroxide. Here, the methyl thiolate ion comes in the form of its sodium salt. Uh, here, the cyanide comes in the form of its potassium salt, the fluoride in the form of its lithium salt. Those counter ions, potassium, sodium, potassium, lithium, and these things, act as mere spectator ions. So if you look, you can see we still have those ions in our products. They're just paired with a different counter ion when everything is all said and done. So you can make a wide range of um, things in these reactions. So if you look at the nature of the products that we have, uh, we get a bunch of things. We can make alcohols by doing substitution. We can make sulfides. These are alkyl nitriles. Uh, we can make uh, alkyl halides of one sort or another, and we can make amine sort of compounds. This is an ammonium salt that we're producing down here. And these are just a, a few uh, simple examples. So we want to dive in and discuss the mechanism of these reactions. But uh, if we're going to discuss mechanisms, we also need to discuss questions with regard to the energy of these reactions and the energetic profile. So the next few slides, we're going to review um, equilibrium, thermodynamics of reactants and products, and we're going to review reaction rates, um, kinetics, energy barriers associated with reactions. So you'll recall from general chemistry that we can describe for any chemical process uh, an equilibrium constant. And so by way of a typical example, uh, if we have a generic chemical equation, we have A moles of A reacting with B moles of B, producing C moles of C and D moles of D. We can express that equilibrium in terms of the relative concentrations of each of the components of the reactions, and that typical expression is the concentrations of the products raised to their stoichiometric coefficients divided by the concentration of the reactants raised to their stoichiometric coefficients. So that gives us a constant that describes the uh, position of equilibrium at any particular temperature. This value is actually ultimately determined by the thermodynamic difference between the reactants and products. In other words, what's the difference in the free energies of the products relative to the free energies of the reactants? And that's known as the Gibbs free energy change, where delta G for the reaction is equal to minus RT log K. You recall here R is simply proportionality constant, T is the absolute temperature. So what this tells us is that a favorable reaction will have a negative delta G, and a disfavorable reaction will have a positive delta G. It takes only very small differences in delta G to result in actually quite a disparity in the concentrations of reactants and products. So for instance, a difference in delta G of just one kilocalorie per mole gives rise to an uh, equilibrium constant of 5.4, and we're talking about essentially an 85-15 mixture at that point. That's a single kilocalorie per mole difference. If you go all the way up to two kilocalories per mole difference, you're talking about an equilibrium that's almost not an equilibrium. It's about a 97.3. So that's a a thing that we've seen again and again is that very small energy differences can give rise to actually quite different ratios in equilibrium processes. Remember 
that the free energy change, the Gibbs free energy change, is dictated by the relative stabilities of the reactants and products. So this means there are really two scenarios at, uh, at the extreme. You can have products that are more stable than reactants, in which case you get a negative delta G for the overall process, or you can have products that are less stable than the reactants, and that would have a positive delta G. Typically, negative delta G reactions are referred to as spontaneous reactions, whereas positive delta Gs are referred to as non-spontaneous reactions. So a spontaneous reaction is one that can proceed under its own energetic impetus. In other words, the reaction is energetically favorable. A non-spontaneous reaction needs to have energy input in order for the reaction to occur. Now you can also think of these diagrams in terms of enthalpies, so the overall enthalpy change for the reaction. And so the terminology we use, if you recall, is that a reaction where the products are more stable than the starting materials from an enthalpy point of view are called exothermic. These would be reactions that would give off heat to their surroundings. In terms of overall energy change, they're called exergonic. Whereas a reaction that is uphill energetically from a thermodynamic point of view, from a heat point of view, is endothermic. These sorts of reactions, when they occur, require an input of energy. They'll absorb energy from their surroundings. Um, and they're called endergonic. So the relationship between delta G and enthalpy is given by the Gibbs free energy change equation. And we see that delta G is uh, determined by not just the enthalpy change in the reaction, but also the entropy change of the reaction. And importantly in this equation, the entropy change is attenuated by temperature, and so that can have an important consequence. So these two terms arise from different aspects of the reacting species. Typically, delta H is predominantly determined by bond strengths. So if you're forming stronger bonds during the course of a reaction, then typically delta H will be a negative number, and the formation of the products is favored. You're going to give off heat to the surroundings. Bond making is an energy-releasing event. On the other hand, if you start with stronger bonds and you have products with weaker bonds, you have to put energy in in order to do that process, and delta H would be a positive value. On the other hand, free en uh, entropy, delta S, is a term that's related to degrees of freedom or freedom of movement. So this has to do with whether the products are less restricted uh, or less ordered than the reactants. So, for example, later in the year, we're going to learn about this kind of reaction. Um, this reaction is, in fact, reversible, but you can take a compound like this, and under the right conditions, that reaction can result in this molecule fragmenting to produce these two molecules. And if you think about the overall energy change in terms of enthalpy and entropy, if you look at the starting materials and you think about the bonds that are involved in this reaction, there are really three. There's a um, sigma bond here and a sigma bond here that have to break, and there is a pi bond here that's involved in the reaction. Uh, in the products, you can see that we have now more pi bonds. So we have a pi bond here and a pi bond here and a pi bond there. Well, if you count up on either side kind of what's involved, we have two... Oops. We have two sigma bonds and one pi bond here that we've highlighted. But over here we have three pi bonds. Sigma bonds are generally stronger than pi bonds. And so we have, on the left-hand side of the equation, we have stronger bonds. On the right-hand side of the equation, we have uh, weak, weaker bonds in total. So from an enthalpy point of view, then we would predict that this reaction is most likely um, endothermic. In other words, delta H is a positive number. But now look at the reactions and see we have a single molecular species on the left-hand side of the equation, but we have two molecules on the right-hand side of the equation. 
from an entropy point of view, we'd say that this reaction, in terms of delta S, that this reaction is increasing in entropy. So if you go up and you look at uh, the Gibbs equation, so look at the Gibbs equation again, uh, we say that delta H in this reaction is a positive number, so that would lead to helping delta G be positive. That's disfavorable. But delta S is a positive number, but notice the negative sign here. So depending on what the temperature is, if this term, the magnitude of that term is greater than this one, the reaction could still occur and be energetically favorable because of the entropy involved, provided the reaction is done at high enough temperature. If we lower the temperature, then likely the reaction would not occur, or another way to think about it is it would go in the opposite direction because the enthalpy change would become dominant. So as I said before, you can, um, the delta H term is predominantly due to bond strengths. You might recall in general chemistry, um, looking at a table such as this, where you had bond strength energies, and from these you could calculate um, the delta H um, for a particular reaction. So we can make actually rather accurate estimates of enthalpy changes. Enthalpy changes are really difficult to predict. You can make uh, an overall uh, assessment of whether entropy is increasing or decreasing, but the magnitude is very difficult to predict without experiment. So the other energy consideration in a reaction beyond the thermodynamics of the starting materials and products, because remember the stability of the starting material and the stability of the product is what determines delta G, the difference in energy. The other energy term that's really important is the energy barrier that has to be overcome to get from the starting material to the product. And so the simple fact of the matter is it's not enough for delta G to be favorable in order for a reaction to occur. You can have a highly favorable delta G for a reaction, and yet the reaction doesn't occur because there's a significantly high barrier to that reaction occurring. Now, how do you get over the barrier, or what molecules can get over the barrier? And it's largely a function of temperature. If you raise the temperature of the reaction, then you raise the proportion of molecules that have enough energy to get over the barrier. It's also important to remember that not all molecules in a system have the same energy. Molecules exist in a statistical distribution, known as a Boltzmann distribution, about an average energy value and that average energy value changes with temperature. So in this diagram, if you look at the graph below, uh, we have two different curves, and these are simply two different Boltzmann distributions at different temperatures. If you look at where the maximum of each of these curves is, it's shifted. Uh, the red line here is at a lower temperature, and the blue line in this diagram is at a higher temperature. So if you imagine some hypothetical reaction that has an energy barrier that lies at this kinetic energy value, then you can see that as we raise the temperature of our sample, we're going to increase the proportion of the molecules that uh, are in that mixture that can make it over the barrier. Uh, on the other hand, if we lower the temperature, you can see we have a very small uh, number of molecules can make it over the barrier. So we can measure those energy barriers, and in doing so, we can determine the so-called rate constant. Uh, rate constant is a fundamental property of any given reaction, and it is uh, specific to temperature. Rate constants change with temperature. So imagine the scenario where we have a simple first-order uh, reaction. So this is a rate equation for a first-order reaction. You remember that... Uh, the order of a reaction um, the order of reaction is simply equal to the sum of the exponents 
on the concentration terms. So in this particular example, we have a reaction uh, where the rate of the reaction is equal to a constant times the concentration of A. Of course, when writing that, we mean that's raised to the first power. This is a first order reaction. We typically um, express rate of reactions uh, in terms of um, a change in concentration per unit time. Uh, and so we can see that change in concentration expressed there. So it's, in this case, moles per liter times per second. So what's being expressed there is essentially molarity per second. So molarity per second. So a change in molarity per unit time. So if we're expressing the concentration in molarity, then it follows that the rate constant must bear the right units in order to give us a rate expressed as molarity per second. And so in this equation, our rate constant is in per second, or 1 over seconds. So the units of rate constant depend on the order of a reaction. If you have a, a second order reaction, so here's uh, a typical equation for a second order reaction, of course, again, it's the sum of the exponents on the um, concentration terms. So we have 1 plus 1. So this is a second order reaction. So if we're going to be multiplying molarity of A times molarity of B, um, and we ultimately want to end up, again, with a rate that's expressed as a concentration per unit time, then the rate constant is going to have to bear units that express that. And so if we do the derivation here to figure out what the units of the rate constant are, if we rearrange this equation and solve for k, just thinking of the units, we're going to have molarity times per second times per molarity times per molarity. Do the um, algebra, you end up with liters over molarity in this. Excuse me, liters over mole seconds. So you can always tell the order of a reaction if you know the units of the rate constant. So this is a rate constant for uh, specifically a second order reaction. So in this chapter, we're going to deal with substitution reactions that are described by two different mechanisms. Um, one of those mechanisms is uh, known as an SN1, the other is an SN2. And the 1 and the 2 in those expressions refer to their kinetic behavior, or more specifically, the order of those reactions. And so if you look at the rate equations for these two specific examples, the first one is in fact an SN1, and we'll go through the mechanism here a little bit later. But that mechanism, that reaction, gives rise to a kinetic behavior that gives a rate equation that looks like that. So if you look at that rate equation, you can see that the rate is solely dependent on the concentration of this t-butyl iodide. So we have t-butyl iodide here. Now even though it's a substitution reaction and there's a nucleophile involved, the concentration of the nucleophile doesn't appear in the rate equation. So there's something about the mechanism of this reaction that gives rise to the fact that the overall rate of the substitution is only dependent on how much t-butyl iodide we have. It's independent of how much water is present, as long as water is present. The second substitution reaction is kinetically very different. So if you look at the second substitution reaction, you can see we have a rate equation here where we see both the concentration of the substrate, in this case the 1-iodobutane, and the nucleophile, in this case hydroxide. So if you go over and look at the reactants, we have 1-iodobutane and we have hydroxide. We have an overall substitution reaction. But mechanistically, this reaction is dependent on both of those things. So there must be some different mechanistic pathway in the way that things 
occur during the reaction that give rise to this kinetic behavior where it would depend on the presence of both of those things in the reaction. And so we're going to try to sort that out as we move forward. So as I said earlier, even a, a, a thermodynamically favorable reaction, this is an example of a thermodynamically favorable reaction, this is the combustion of methane. So methane reacting with oxygen to produce CO2 and water. This is a thermodynamically favorable reaction. But you can mix together methane and oxygen without any reaction occurring. This was happening in lab the other day. I couldn't write, light the Bunsen burner. You have to supply some minimum amount of energy in order to get over the barrier. Now what that implies is that there's some chemical species that has to form. So some species that we call a transition state that is unstable. It is, uh, it, it has to you have to supply energy in order to get into that state, but once you get there, you can easily pass all the way on to the products from there. So getting this energy into the reaction and what the nature of that transition state is going to be important for us to understand moving forward. So let's look more closely at our first substitution reaction, and we're going to look at the SN2 substitution, which is the mechanistically more uh, simple of the, uh, the two substitution reactions. So in this illustration we can see an energy diagram for the reaction of cyanide ion with methyl iodide. So if you look at the overall reaction, uh, reactive species here in the graph, we're seeing cyanide reacting with methyl iodide to produce methyl cyanide, acetonitrile, uh, an iodide ion. If we get rid of the spectator ion, and we just write this as a simple uh, overall process, it's cyanide reacting with methyl iodide, producing acetonitrile, and iodide ion. So that's our overall reaction. It's a simple one-step mechanism. We'll draw the curved arrows uh, in a little bit. Um, and the barrier that has to be overcome is due to the formation of a transition state that's illustrated here. Uh, and in that transition state, the dotted lines, notice the little dotted lines, represent partial bonds. And so we can illustrate with curved arrows what the mechanism is that's uh, being depicted for that. And so if we draw out our substrates in greater detail, and we're going to think three-dimensional structures here. Not very good drawing today. So what's happening during the course of this reaction is a cyanide ion, if we draw the Lewis structure of a cyanide ion, is coming in, it's forming a bond to carbon, and at the same time we're rupturing the bond between carbon and iodide and we end up forming our products that include the iodide ion. So a couple things to, uh, to note about this reaction. It is in fact one step. So this is the total mechanism. It is one mechanistic step that's indicated by one reaction arrow in our mechanism. You'll notice that we have in our mechanism two curved arrows, okay, and the fact that the two curved arrows are written here uh, in this mechanistic step means that these things happen at the same time, 
So the bond is forming between uh, the cyanide ion and the carbon at the same time as the bond between carbon and iodine is breaking. Um, there's a name for that that we use in our mechanisms. Uh, we call this process concerted. The notion is that um, the bond making, which is indicated by this arrow, and the bond breaking are happening in concert with one another at the same time. Now, the other aspect to this mechanism that's important is the fact that we're combining both the cyanide ion and the methyl ionide in the formation of the transition state. So in order to make that species, you need both the substrate, the methyl iodide, and the cyanide ion. And so this reaction is going to be, as the in, is indicated in the designation, it's going to be second order. In other words, we could write a rate equation for this process, and we would say the rate of this reaction is going to be equal to a constant times the concentration of cyanide times the concentration of methyl iodide. And we know that's going to be true because, again, if we look at the transition state and the structure that's present there, you have to have both of those things. So if you think about the concentration of the um, transition state, it's going to depend on um, how much cyanide you have present and how much methyl iodide because you need both of them to make that. Now one other aspect to think about with regard to this reaction is there's going to be a direction to the reaction. In other words, the reaction is favorable from a free energy sense in one direction and it's unfavorable in a free energy sense from the other direction. So if you look at this illustration here and you notice Look at the way the axes have been driven. If you think about the reverse process, what is the activation energy for the reverse process? And the activation energy is actually from here to here. And remember that that activation energy determines the rate. So the rate of the reverse reaction is going to be very, very slow compared to the rate of the forward reaction because the free energy of activation of the forward reaction is quite small. So we have a reaction that's energetically favorable both from a thermodynamic point of view, the products, carbon-carbon bond is stronger than the carbon iodide bond, the products are more stable than the starting materials, and the rate of the forward reaction is much more rapid than the rate of the reverse reaction. The result is we have a good reaction that we can carry out in the laboratory, and it should give us products. Now, why can we make this reasoning with regard to the forward and the reverse? And this is Thing known as the principle of microscopic reversibility, and that is that reactions follow the lowest energy path in both the forward and the reverse direction. An example that's commonly given is this sort of thing, where if you have two villages and those villages are separated by a range of mountains, and there is a mountain pass, uh, or two different mountain passes, then if you're going to get from village A to village B, and the red pathway follows the best path in, from village A to village B, then it follows by that reasoning that the best path from village B back to village A is along the same path. There might be other pathways that are higher in energy, um, but the red path is going to be the lowest energy path in either direction. So one more aspect that we're going to deal with when we look at these mechanisms is how does the stereochemistry of these reactions play out? So now that we've drawn our mechanism of this reaction, we said that it's one step. The nucleophile and the leaving group are kind of involved in a transition state. Then what's the overall outcome of the reaction in terms of stereochemistry? So we can actually envision for this reaction three possible stereochemical outcomes, and those are all illustrated here. So if you notice, we have 
uh, a generically drawn chiral substrate where we have one, two, three different groups attached to the carbon. So the numbers here are indicating these are three substituents. And then we have some sort of leaving group. So this is a substrate that can undergo a substitution reaction. And we have a nucleophile. So you can imagine three scenarios. One is where the nucleophile replaces the leaving group and doesn't disrupt the configuration of the groups attached to carbon. The result is that 1, 2, and 3 essentially stay in the same place, and all we've done is replace the leaving group with a nucleophile. And so we refer to that as retention of configuration, that three-dimensionality. If the leaving group and the nucleophile have the same priority in our CIP designations, then if this was S, it would remain S, for instance. The second scenario is that the nucleophile displaces the leaving group, and during that process, this carbon essentially turns inside out. So the leaving group leaves, and these groups flop over to the other side. If the leaving group and the nucleophile occupy the same priority in our priority scheme, so let's say they have priority number four in the one, two, three, four, then we would get an inversion of configuration that the S would become R, for instance. And then finally, you can imagine a scenario that's kind of somewhere in between, where mechanistically something's happening, and during the course of that reaction, we get essentially a mixing of stereochemistry. So we might start with a chiral substrate, but we end up with a racemic mixture for some reason. And that process is called racemization. So the three scenarios are retention of configuration, inversion of configuration, and racemization. All right, so back to the SN2 reaction specifically. So if the reaction is happening by our SN2 mechanism, what happens? And the answer is highlighted here, and that is we get complete inversion of configuration. There's a German chemist who first noted this uh, by the name of Walden, and it's still sometimes now called the Walden inversion, this inversion of configuration that takes place uh, at the substrate. So why does inversion occur? So why does inversion occur, this inversion of stereochemistry? Well, it has to do with the mechanistic pathway that the reaction is following. Um, so we said, uh, in our example that we showed with the cyanide, uh, we said that the cyanide ion is reacting with our substrate. So in this case, we had a methyl iodide. And we drew our mechanism for this, and in our mechanism for this, we said that the cyanide uh, forms a bond to carbon and the iodine leaves. Now, at the time, I didn't really talk about the particular trajectory that that was taking. But in fact, there's a very good reason why it's happening in the way I'm illustrating here, where it's essentially attacking that carbon from the opposite side of where the iodine is. All right, so there's our overall reaction, and that's the mechanistic step that we've drawn. So it turns out that the nucleophile in the reaction has to interact with the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. And the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital is, in fact, a sigma star orbital. And so that sigma star orbital the empty orbital in the substrate has its largest lobe pointing here, where I've drawn it, opposite where the leaving group is. And so that's where the electrons from our nucleophile are coming. So in our homo lumo nomenclature, the highest occupied molecular orbital of our nucleophile is interacting with the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital of our substrate. And that particular location of that orbital is opposite where the leaving group is. And so it's, it's in this orientation here. And so that's indicated here. Nucleophile comes in from the backside, leaving group goes the other direction. And again, this takes us back to what we said at the beginning of the chapter, is we have this interaction of Lewis base, Lewis acid, electron pair donor, highest occupied molecular orbital, electron pair acceptor, lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, we get a reaction between the two and we get a net stabilization. In this case, we get a net stabilization because we're forming a much stronger bond, carbon-carbon bond, and breaking a weaker bond, carbon iodide bond, and so we're getting uh, 
a, a, a favorable delta G for the overall reaction. So if we kind of illustrate that with uh, a really, really simple example, then the inversion of stereochemistry gives us now uh, a very specific mechanistic picture of the SN2 reaction. And so that's illustrated here with an indication of what the transition state. So what we're looking at here is the, the transition state in brackets. So typically, um, chemists draw transition states uh, like this one here in little square brackets. Uh, you'll sometimes see them indicate, usually here as a subscript, they'll put a little dagger that indicates it's a transition state. This one is negatively charged because the overall system is negatively charged. And you can see that we're going from a carbon that's sp3 hybridized and tetrahedral through a transition state that for all intents and purposes is sp2 hybridized to a product that's sp3 hybridized but inverted. And that's happening because our nucleophile has to form its bond with the LUMO, which is pointing opposite the leaving group. And so we're forming this uh, transitory structure where our nucleophile is coming in this direction, the leaving group is going out that direction, and then we ultimately get to the products. So that middle species is a transition state. And the thing to remember about a transition state is it's not stable. It has no finite lifetime. Uh, the reaction simply passes through it. This particular reaction that's being illustrated here is energetically degenerate, so the starting material and product are exactly the same because we have iodide displacing iodide. Uh, but the important thing is, is that we have to overcome this barrier. This is an unstable species, and so there's a certain minimum amount of energy that has to be put into the reaction. If the reaction isn't a degenerate reaction, if it's a favorable reaction, we still are going to get a transition state, but the transition state is going to occur slightly earlier in our timeline. So if you look at this timeline and you compare it to the previous one, if you look at where we are in the timeline with respect to reactants and products, the transition state isn't halfway along the timeline. The transition state's actually a little earlier in the timeline. If you look at the structure that's shown up here, you can see the nucleophile coming in. It's interacting with the LUMO, which has got a lobe pointing opposite the leaving group. But look at the uh, carbon here in, in the middle, and you'll notice that it's not perfectly planar, that our transition state is happening before it's become planar. So this is what's known typically uh, as an early transition state. Whereas in the previous example, it was a midpoint transition state, exactly halfway between reactants and products. Why is this an early transition state? And the simple answer to the question is that this is a reaction that is, in fact, energetically favorable. We have more stable products then we do reactants, we have a favorable delta G. So we have a smaller energy barrier in the forward direction, a larger energy barrier uh, in the reverse direction. And so the transition state's happening a little earlier in them. But again, it has that same basic structure where the carbon is essentially turning kind of inside out. You can think of this as an umbrella flopping inside out in the wind as the nucleophile comes in one side and the leaving group leaves the other side. All right, that's it for this introduction to substitution reactions. We will continue on from there next week.